All right, I think. Says we're live. <laughs> well, I've got a message that says webinar is now streaming live on Facebook. Okay, awesome. I think I, I agree. I think we're live. And for the first time, I'm actually hitting record because I haven't been doing that lately. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I've done that a couple of times where I forget to record something that I intentionally record. And so we end up with starting about 20 minutes later than we intended with that record. Um, that's awkward. Absolutely. Well, and we have a podcast too. And so I don't have the MP3 files for the podcast for the last three or four that we've done. So I need to technologically figure that out. But good morning, everybody. And welcome to Dyslexia Coffee Talk. We have William Van Cleve with us today. I know everybody's definitely excited about this one. So I'm not going to waste any time. We're just going to get to it. So thanks for joining us, uh, Mr. Van Cleve. Well, you can call me William. Uh, that's great. So I'm super happy to be here. Uh, it sounds like you've had some exciting speakers. Uh, and I'm, I'm glad to join the fray, if you will. <laughs> We're definitely very excited to have you. Um, like you and I were talking about before we went live, um, you know, uh, dysgraphia is a big piece with our community and where you seem to really have found your passion is syntax and grammar and spelling and handwriting. And um, a lot of our parents talk about dysgraphia and they're trying to figure out like where to begin. And, you know, it's sort of the hardest, like you were saying, the hardest thing to remediate, but it's also one of the hardest things to find information out about. Um, so with our parent community, one of the biggest questions we get is, I don't even know where to begin. You know, my child's behind in their written expression. I don't even know where to begin. Where, what would you what would you suggest? So, so I think uh, there are a couple of things. And one is, I think dysgraphia is... Uh, uh, an accurate diagnosis, I believe in the term, of course, but it's a catch-all for a number of different things. So I think that one of the things that's, that parents would need to do first is to get some accurate information about exactly how the dysgraphia is manifesting itself in their son or daughter or sons and daughters, depending on the situation. So, you know, um, I have seen students with dysgraphia who have absolutely no spelling issues whatsoever. It is just sort of a um, language brain to hand, um, you know, difficulty with letter formation, what have you. I have seen dysgraphic students who can't spell cat. Uh, you know, I have seen dysgraphic students whose spelling is, is good, but their ability to generate ideas and get that out onto paper is, is difficult. So what they do write, spelling really isn't affected, but the, the output is not what you would expect from a student that age. Um, I have also seen students um, whose dysgraphia manifests itself as um, relatively rapid writing. So at first blush, it doesn't really look like there's an issue, but that rapid writing is also relatively illegible and tends to wander um, not with the focus or the sort of target that you would expect from a student of whatever age that is. So um, you often see dysgraphia uh, uh, comorbidity with dyslexia, but you sometimes don't. There are students with dysgraphia who have no dyslexia at all. There are lots of students with dyslexia with no dysgraphia at all. Um, dysgraphia isn't a super, super common uh, diagnosis. Um, and then I also think there's another group. There's another group who have been diagnosed with dysgraphia who really are caught by poor handwriting instruction, um, ineffective uh, instruction, and I wouldn't call those students dysgraphic at all. I would say that with proper remediation, um, the quote, dysgraphia sort of um, uh, erases itself. Uh, and, and you say, oh, this student who was testing as dysgraphic or who somebody said was dysgraphic turns out um, was uh, poorly taught and with correct instruction or, or more targeted instruction, really that isn't an issue anymore. So I think that your first step in this process is figure out how the dysgraphia is manifesting itself. What are the specific attributes in that child? Because you can't target remediation until you know exactly what you're you're remediating basically wow that's that's a lot <laughs> but that's an awesome answer I love, I love that answer because it's you're right it's completely accurate um so i heard you speak uh, about a year and a half ago here in houston and um so i'm in i'm in my mid-40s so i was raised in, in a different educational era so I had, you know, sentence diagramming and, you know, grammar out the wazoo and, you know, mm -hmm. 
my eighth grade teacher was named Mrs. Ezernak, and that was grammar hell. So <laughs> fair, fair. Only teacher I remember. <laughs> Yes, uh, some people in the field call them uh, uh, grammar Nazis. Um, uh, maybe not not kindly, but but certainly that that sort of rigid rule following, uh, you know, what have you. So absolutely, definitely. But one of the things that sort of has struck me over you know the course of trying to advocate for my child more than anything else is how far it seems we've sort of removed ourselves from teaching grammar and sentence diagramming and syntax to. You know, it's it's there, definitely, um, and you see it in state reg, uh, state standards. But when you were speaking, I was sitting there going, "Oh my God, you're speaking my language. You're speaking." <laughs> I was blown away. Um, I actually cried through part of what you were teaching because oh, I was dear. so I was so moved by it because my son needs it so badly. So. For, and I did buy some of your materials and I have sent bought more of your materials. <laughs> That's great to hear. Thank you. But um, for those children that are struggling with truly with grammar and syntax, even if it's just, even if it's not dysgraphia, it's just part of their dyslexia or what have you, how would you recommend sort of as a parent helping those kids sort of navigate that path? So um, the research uh, has taken us on a kind of a, uh, an interesting wandering route in terms of syntax instruction. And there is a lot of research that indicates that direct explicit grammar instruction taught in isolation does not build better writers. So the notion of sort of, you know, underlining and boxing and circling and what have you. And I do a little bit of that in my instruction and I do a little bit of that in my materials as well but it says a segue or a stepping stone into something more significant. Um, and so I, you know, I'm very into having kids develop the vocabulary of syntax. Let's know what a noun is. Let's know what a clause is, those kinds of things. But those are, that's to facilitate communication. You know, we have a set of terms to facilitate, to make a topic easier to talk about. Uh, you know, and what I say in my syntax workshops is, you know, I am currently, as we talk, I'm sitting at a four-legged object with a flat top that I can put my computer on. And we have the word Word table. And the reason we have the word table is so that we don't have to say four legged object with a flat top that you put stuff on, right? So it facilitates our communication. So I'm not about learning nouns so that I know the definition of a noun. I'm about learning about nouns so that we don't have to say people, places, things, and ideas that are, you know, in sentences doing this thing. So, so as you build this kind of suite of vocabulary, you're using that to talk about, about writing. And when I first started doing uh, writing workshops, which is way, way too long ago, um, uh, you know, my syntax workshops, I would have explicitly talked about writing instruction, but I would not have talked, uh, uh, if at all, I wouldn't have talked enough about the link to reading comprehension. So one of the things that I want us to sort of recognize is that when we look at syntax as it applies to writing, we're also having kind of a, a swing around where we're discussing how it, it applies to reading comprehension as well. And, and you know, a lot of the research is saying, okay, we can only write in context and we can only edit in context and what have you. And, and you know, my argument to that is if you're spending a lot of time sort of fixing run-ons and fixing fragments and, and doing these kinds of things, wouldn't it be better to teach kids a suite of skills to allow them to build correct sentences coming out the first time around? You know, uh, let's not have to edit two thirds of our sentences. Let's build sentences. And, and one of the things about syntax instruction is nouns and verbs are all fine, but what we're really doing is getting out of these building block pieces, the higher level pieces, clause structure, et cetera. It starts in about third grade. And when you look at that, what you're doing is you're, you're building in kids a repertoire of options. Do you have more than one way to express an idea at the sentence level, you know, because there isn't just one way, uh, you know, if, if I gave everybody who's listening to this chat right now, if I gave all of them a topic and asked them to craft a sentence, none of the sentences would be the same, right? We, we'd all be crafted. So, so, and then as you build in that suite, you're building in reading comp. So, so when I'm looking at a student um, who needs instruction, I'm thinking about parent support, getting kids to think about, you know, sentence level writing altogether 
is a big aha for some people. There are plenty of writing uh, programs within schools where it's all about we're going to write the journal, we're going to do the free write, we're going to do the argument essay without any of, or the narrative, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to leave narrative out, um, without any of the infrastructure, the building blocks that make that, uh, uh, you know, a possibility. So when I think about kids who struggle with writing and, you know, go back to the dysgraphics or, or students with this dyslexia, um, I think about getting these, these skills in and helping these skills uh, get to the level of automaticity so that that student who struggles doesn't have quite so much he's grappling with when he's trying to generate a good sentence or, 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 or write something. So, so, you know, the idea of a kid who writes almost all run-ons, well, yeah, I guess you can fix that on the editing, but let's teach the kid to speak and communicate in writing with complete sentences in the first place. So, you know, that's one of the things that a parent can do is really think about that. I think a parent can be observant uh, when kids are reading. Um, and I think also uh, we tend, uh, you know, my, my BA and my master's, they're both in English. I love a good novel, but I think a lot of the reading kids have to do in school is not fiction. You know, you've got to read the biology text or the social studies text or the what have you, that informational text reading. And there's really interesting informational text as well that we can read and we can talk about with our kids um, and, you know, get them to express, you know, what is going on in this sentence or this paragraph, you know, what's happening, let's talk about this, why is this interesting or not. You know, not all informational text is interesting, of course. Um, okay. What's going on in this story? Uh, you know, what what makes it so vivid? Oh, it's the adjectives we're using to describe the character. You know, doing some of that infrastructure conversation can be really powerful. But I think at some level, they're going to have to have some sort of school or tutorial set up where there's an infrastructure where all of these cool things we're doing fits into a framework that makes sense for kids. Yeah. And that makes complete sense. I mean, I'm thinking about a paper my son wrote earlier this school year where it was an entire page of one sentence. Ah, those are really fun, aren't they? And they are. getting kids to read those out loud without breathing between the sentences, they'll turn purple in the face. It can be actually somewhat amusing, right? So, and I don't have any research on this, but but my understanding is that oxygen produces better writers. So if you if you can breathe, you know, while you're reading and writing, you're probably going to do a better a better job. Sure, it is. But I think you hit on something keen, which is you know I've I've read the writing revolution. Mm -hmm. And, you know, within the, oh, within the introduction of the book, there's, there's the quote, reading is breathing in, writing is breathing out. But mm -hmm. while we give our dyslexic children systematic, explicit, you know, dyslexia remediation, we're not necessarily always giving that writing explicitly, systematically as well. But what the re writing revolution talks about so keenly is that both have to be taught explicitly and systematically and just because you teach a child to read doesn't mean that you teach a child to write absolutely not and in fact writing is more difficult because it's predicated on the knowledge of reading you can't write unless you can read but you can read even if you can't write uh, or you could learn to read i'm sorry but you know it is po let me put that differently it is possible to read without knowing how to write it is not possible to write without knowing how to read because you can't read what you're writing or the stuff you're writing about um so it's actually a more difficult skill because it's predicated on the skills that you're already getting from the reading process and i i think you're absolutely right a lot of dyslexia remediation out there is concerned with teaching kids to read and if you look at the big organizations out there for struggling uh struggling kids a lot of them have reading in the name. Not all of them have writing in the name, but they, they include writing. They're willing to embrace it that, you know, but, but, you know, we've got this big focus on teaching every child to read and teaching. Every, okay. Well, if you're going to communicate about what you're reading and if you're going to make it into higher ed, which is the way out of poverty, you got to know how to write too, because writing is going to be the way you show your understanding of and your ability to integrate what you're reading. Yeah. So I hate, I hate to ask you this question, but this is sort of a question that I run into a lot. So this is like writing or English language 101. Can you explain the difference between grammar and syntax? Sure, I, I like that question actually. So, <laughs> so um, grammar is, there are kind of two definitions of grammar, which is one of the reasons that I've been using it less and less. So one definition of grammar is sort of the, OCD coding labeling, you know, let's go to teachers pay teachers and download a 50 page noun packet and have kids underline that. So, so when, when teachers say it's grammar time in school, 
too often that's what they mean. You know, this is the time where we're going to learn something directly. We're going to underline and find a lot of them, you know, in seek and find mode. We're going to learn a lot of little rules. Um, and we're not going to, I mean, I love doing sentence work and identifying things, but it's all about sort of how those words work with other words to convey meaning. And not enough grammar instruction uh, involves that. Okay. But grammar is also used to mean something else. You talk about the grammar of English, and that's the overall framework, and that includes syntax and it includes morphology. So at a very simple level for morphology, it would be something like the difference between danger and dangerous. And dangerous is an adjective, right? And it has suffix O-U-S on it. So, so that kind of thing. So when I go to syntax, I actually include some morphology in my syntax work, but I like the word syntax and I've really embraced it because uh, teachers don't misunderstand syntax. They don't think I mean something else. They either know what syntax is or they don't, and then they listen up and we can talk about it. Whereas if you say grammar, people get this whole like negative vibe thing. So syntax is a very specific thing. It's the arrangement of words in a sentence. So it's word order. And, you know, some definitions say it's the, you know, sophisticated arrangement of words to vote. But basically, it's word order. If I walked up to you and said, tree climbed I yesterday the, you might be able to figure out what I was doing, but my syntax is way off. So, mm -hmm. so that's the word order. Um, in essence, uh, syntax is also what makes Yoda sound cool. So he shifts <laughs> his syntax a little bit, um, but not so much that we need a translator line to understand him. He's close enough to, to English syntax. Um, and different languages actually have different syntactic structures, um, both the dead languages um, and, and you know current languages like Spanish or what have you. So, so syntax is about word order. If you don't have major, major language disorders, your spoken syntax is probably okay. Most students with dyslexia, they don't speak in an out of order kind of framework, what have you for words typically. And I don't mean like a quick little word flip. I mean like really jarringly off. That to now, you can also have a language disorder, which is a fundamental kind of core disorder different from a specific, you know, reading writing disability. Sometimes those kids' uh, syntax is skewed. Um, now what happens though is, there's a difference between written and spoken syntax. Written syntax is much more sophisticated and deeper. So when you see a kid with a reading disability, that kid probably isn't reading at grade level. He's not accessing writing, reading syntax at the level that his peers are. So he's only exposed to spoken syntax. So he gets, you know, what the, the Dyslexia Association's uh, definition calls secondary consequences. He'll have vocab issues and syntax issues. He doesn't have a bad syntax gene or a bad vocab gene. He's not accessing text to get vocab and syntax the way his classmates are. So, so those kids, uh, when they go to write, they may write in super simplistic fashion um, uh, because they haven't been introduced to, exposed to, and haven't explored those more sophisticated ways of writing that we don't necessarily reflect in our speech. How would you, so you have a child who is dyslexic, you know, they've had the remediation I don't mean to put you on the spot. They've had the remediation and maybe they're reading at grade level, right? Okay. Maybe they're even reading a little bit ahead of grade level. Okay. That's not putting me on the spot so far. Okay. <laughs> but from the written expression side, the, you know, the written expression is behind, you know, whether it's one grade level or, or, or more than that, how would you, how would you recommend bringing the child forward from a, from the written syntax point of view, because like you've said, it is so different. And like you, I mean, I only have an undergraduate in English. I didn't get a master's in English. I got a master's in business instead. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I think about all of the things that I've written over the course of my life, you know, in the papers and somebody actually completely outside of my dyslexia circle posted a funny meme this morning that was like two different pictures and it was like how I appear in writing and it was you know uh, the dowager countess from Downton Abbey is how she appears in writing versus how how I appear spoken and it was somebody you know like cow, you know cowboy hat on a farm like slap in the back of the cow <laughs> but, sure <laughs> yeah that's a great way to think about that actually yeah, I, 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 I agree. I thought it was sort of brilliant, but 
it is it is such a different thing how do you i mean how do you how do you begin to teach that how do you begin to you know pull that child or to make the syntax of the two match. So, so if your reading and writing are at grade level or close or slightly above or what, I'm sorry, I'm not, sorry, I didn't mean your reading and writing. You're reading your comprehension. Those skills are up, okay? Mm -hmm. and, and you're in good shape. You know, that's certainly a time when you can commit tutorial time or classroom teaching time more focused, right, on, on your, your writing piece. And, you know, I think one thing is you want to make sure you are reading rich text. Um, and I think you want to read a diversity of, of, you know, authors and perspectives. So, yes, you need some fiction. And by all means, read your favorite author's latest book. That's great, okay? But, but you also want to be reading some informational text, things like that. You want to be writing meaningfully about that. And you want to be scaffolding and breaking down the steps of the writing process. So at the paragraph essay level, that may be, you know, you know when I do my paragraph workshops, I'm talking about a whole level where we are planning and we're idea generating and, you know, we're creating a, a sort of a game plan and we're getting our ideas down to reduce that working memory overload um, get the ideas out it's the same reason that you make a shopping list before you go shopping unless you want to come home without everything you meant to get right so so you know it's the same thing because you're you're you could actually hold on to your list in your head but you wouldn't leave yourself any room in your head for anything else that happens like you know where are my car keys and and you know somebody just cut in front of me with their cart and whatever okay so so that's one piece and then at the sentence level you know i'm very direct and explicit in my piece. What I'm different from sort of the traditional old school grammar is I'm not doing, I mean, I do a little labeling, but there's not a whole lot of this coding piece. What I would get kids doing is I would teach them clause structure, which is the step that's really past noun, verb, pronoun, adjective, adverb. Um, the clauses are these building blocks that you use to build sentences. Um, I would teach them clause structure, and I would show them different ways to combine these, these Legos, these building blocks, to create different kinds of sentences. And when you do that, you get kids to practice sentences of that kind in their own writing, whether it's isolated sentences. So when I'm doing syntax tutorial um, with a student, you know, we start every lesson. Our bell ringer or our opening activity is write this kind of sentence this kind of sentence and this kind of sentence, like whatever we're working on, you know, two or three different sentences. We talk about them. We take apart their own sentences uh, rather than, you know, somebody else's or another student's or one that's a run on or something like that. Um, and, you know, the research says we should be writing about something, you know, something deep or meaningful. So we're writing about the novel we're reading or when I'm doing tutorial, I'm not always, re uh, you know, reading a novel with a kid. We write about the novel the kid's reading in school. We write about what he's studying. Um, I had a student at the beginning of COVID who I was tutoring, a uh, sixth grader, really cool kid. And we were tutoring, you know, a couple times a week. And the sentences started to get really kind of flat and tedious. They were syntactically correct, but nothing to write home about, right? So, so what we started doing is we jumped on the San Diego Zoo website, believe it or not, and we started reading about quirky animals. I'll never forget the first one was the harpy eagle. I learned all kinds of crazy things about the harpy eagle I didn't know. So we would read this, not a huge long text, read two or three paragraphs, and then we would go to our writing document and I'd say, okay, student whose name I won't say, um, you know, okay, would you write a complex sentence about something you just learned from the Harp Eagle? He could look back over, get the information. His sentences, it wasn't a magic trick. He had something meaningful to write about. They went way up in terms of content and interest. And he was juggling with the syntax we were learning to try to get the ideas through that filter of the syntax. Um, so, you know, that's that piece is, I'm very into, uh, you know, a lot of the research says write only in context, work only in context, but I'm really into breaking that piece down, working things in isolation until they're automatic or more comfortable, and then reincorporating them into the writing process. So then the next thing is you're writing a paragraph on some topic and you say, by the way, I want one of those complex sentences we've been working on in that paragraph. So that's your next step where they're being kind of intentional about their syntax. So I'm giving you really long answers today. Sorry, um, I'm, I'm definitely in syntax mode. Though you're in my topic. So anyway, no, I'm 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 loving these answers. I'm I'm gonna I'm going to rewatch this later and take a lot of notes. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> no, it's I'm not a simple kind of like whatever. <laughs> anyway, especially when I'm talking about this. But but anyway, so I go, so that's that's good. <laughs> um, but 
I'm trying. I'm trying to the the syntax clause. Is that what you called it? Um, so so there are two kinds of levels of of syntax. So one is the parts of speech, and that's the grammar, the syntax that most people know about. So that's nouns and verbs and prepositions and whatever. And it, even if they don't know what prepositions are, they vaguely remember that. Too often, kids don't get to the clause level, or if they do, they get to it in like middle school. It's really, uh, you know, it's in most standards uh, around third grade. Um, not the clause, but the kind of sentence that really is enhanced by knowledge of the clause. And Clauses, I mean, very briefly, I won't give you a syntax lesson today for this, this recording, but, but you know, very brief, briefly, a clause is just a group of words that has a subject and a predicate in it. And, you know, most of your audience least know those words, subject and predicate. It's the doer and the do, you know, at, at the basic level, it gets fancier. But, but um, and then when you take those clauses, each one having a subject and predicate, you can combine them in different ways. And I really, I tell kids, it's a lot like Legos. Because even kids who are no longer playing with Legos, they don't think Legos are uncool. I mean, you can now get a $400, you know, Eiffel Tower and build it as an adult in retirement, right? So, so, so I think about Legos is such a good metaphor for this because you can put Legos together in different ways to make different structures, right? That's how Legos work. That's exactly what you do with these building blocks for sentences. You can put them together in different ways to build different kinds of sentences. Yeah. Uh, to remind you, I'm the one that posted the Hogwarts Lego a few weeks ago that you ah. commented on. <laughs> that was me. Yes, I, I do remember that. That's so funny. So Legos, I, I haven't played with Legos in a while. I'm not going to lie. But in retirement, there's a good chance that I will turn off social media and I will play, I will reintroduce myself to video games and I will play science fiction video games and build crazy Lego projects for my own satisfaction. I, I think that would be a wonderful thing. My uh, sister-in-law actually is from Denmark and her uncle used to work for Lego. Go. And I never got over there. Um, unfortunately, she lives here in the States. Um, and so uh, I but he would have given me the private Lego tour. And I got all these really cool kind of backdoor Lego products that aren't really carried in the mainstream. I got these really cool Lego things, little teeny things that are like only carried if you manufacture or whatever. So uh, <laughs> anyway, so uh, yeah, Hogwarts Legos is crazy. Yes. It, and it took it took me about 48 hours to build it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, but to get back to our topic, <laughs> the um, but I, I like the analogy of the Legos because you're right. The cat jumped on the tree versus the black cat jumped on the tree versus, you know, the black cat was running away from the dog. And so it jumped into the tree. <laughs> yeah. Versus leapt into the tree, you know, and, and uh, or leapt into the withered oak tree with branches, you know, whatever, uh, you know, absolutely. But also at the informational text level, something like the difference between um, uh, Abraham Lincoln was president of the United States. Abraham Lincoln helped free the slaves versus Abraham Lincoln who helped to free the slaves was president of the United States. And that's, you know, that's not just the descriptive language. That's a syntactically more sophisticated, interesting way to express that exact same idea, um, but just framing it a little differently. So, yeah. Um, great example. Um, handwriting. So handwriting is something that also comes up a great deal of the time. And I know that handwriting is also one of your passions. So, um, I've, I've heard Dr. Brenda Taylor lecture as well, specifically about handwriting print versus cursive. Um, I don't, I don't want to put any words into your mouth, but if I just handwriting in general, what's the first thing that you would tell people about handwriting? Um, that it still matters, that the research says it still matters and that the research is current. Um, you know, there's this sense that, you know, if, if the research were 1980s before we were really a computer culture, then you wouldn't have anything to stand on. But, you know, um, uh, Ginger Berninger's last research study before she retired was in 2016. None of this is old. Um, so this is current research, and it validates again and again that handwriting instruction is absolutely essential, essential not just for writing but also connections to spelling and reading as well. Um, and, and that, that you know, uh, Ginger talks about uh, a hybrid writers in the 21st century. So kids who 
are both adept with the keyboard and word processing and also adept with handwriting, uh, you know, et cetera. So 50 years from now, maybe Siri is going to take over the world and we will only be doing speech to text and there really won't be any, and the brain will be rewired. I have no idea how that'll work or what that'll work. I probably won't be alive in 50 years. Um, but but uh, right now, the research overwhelmingly says that we cannot leave handwriting behind um, I, you know, in our effort to get kids modernized and into the tech world and, and blah, blah, blah. But that just doesn't make any sense. And you're absolutely able to learn both. So why wouldn't we, we learn those? And, and, you know, I was talking with somebody this morning in a syntax workshop, and she was talking about how her school had just gotten rid of handwriting instruction. They were trying to juggle all the different things. They're trying to make the time work. Like, I get it. You know, I've never met a teacher who says, oh, I've got an extra three hours every day, and I'm wondering how to fill it up. You know, everybody's really pressed for time. So they're trying to make good choices. And she says, well, you know, they were trying to reflect the standards in our state, which don't really mention handwriting. And, and I said, ah, that's really frustrating for me, because if you look at the writing strand of any set of standards, that's predicated on, it's based on the concept that you're already fluent with handwriting. You can't write a good essay by hand unless you. You can't type a good essay unless you have keyboarding skills. Neither one of those things is emphasized in the standards. And I don't blame the standards, but I do blame, I don't know, blame is a tough word. I think people are short-sighted when they don't recognize that a precursor to writing a sentence, a paragraph, an essay is the ability to form letters and words automatically without, uh, you know, sort of having to focus attention on it. Um, and that's where our dysgraphic students struggle so much is because, you know, if they're, if they're writing, uh, you know, legible, attractive print or cursive, it's requiring some working memory for a student with dysgraphia. That's taking away their ability, some of their space for where a, a typical kid who's not struggling with dysgraphia would be having more space to organize ideas and get more content and be richer in there, you know, so they get penalized. And so you see a, a student with dysgraphia, um, you'll see a kid who's often pretty articulate. And then you look at him in writing and you're like, what just happened? You know, there's this weird disconnect, you know, um, and it's a teacher who's not educated about this would say, oh, the kid's lazy or the kid was, you know what? And I don't like, that's just a misinformed teacher. I don't really blame the teacher for that, but, but it's misinformation. Um, and, and, you know, what you see is a kid who has difficulty with getting that fabulous brain down on paper, you know, that's, that's dysgraphia, but it's also, you know, it's dyslexia, it's difficulty with spelling. There are a lot of different things that contribute to that output issue. Yeah, no, I, you reminded me of something my son said to me about a, about a year ago, and he was very frustrated with something he was trying to write. This was right before we went into COVID. It, he was very frustrated with something that he was trying to write and you know, I, I, was I was trying to pull the words of his frustration out of him. And he said, mom, first I have to think about my handwriting and then I have to think about my spelling. So by the time I get to think about what it is that I'm writing, I just want it to be over with. Yeah, yeah, I know, absolutely. And I, you know, I use the metaphor of a stove when I talk about writing. I may have even done that in Houston when I saw you, but, but you know, the idea behind the stove is, you can only juggle so many things on the front burner of that stove where you're really attending to them. And that's what I think of as the working memory. The back burners, the things that are running automatically comfortably without your having to attend to them. Um, and and uh, you know, you've got to have some of the stuff that's involved in writing on those back burners. Otherwise you can't write well because you can't juggle all the things you got to fit. Yeah, yeah. And I do remember the stove analogy and I thought it was absolutely brilliant. Um, and, and when he made that statement, it, it really brought your stove analogy home for me. You know, you, you know people can talk about working memory from my perspective and it, and it, and it all makes sense until he sort of verbalized it to me. I was struggling with how that necessarily related to him. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly. He just verbalized the stove. I actually use, um, I was at a school um, for students with dyslexia uh, doing a workshop uh, in Winston-Salem, uh, North Carolina. It's called Triad at Summit. And I've been there a lot, doing a lot of work. They're a great school. And, and um, I was showing them the stove again, the teachers. And one of the teachers, he's a middle school teacher. He said, you know, William, I show the kids the stove all the time. And I don't know, I felt like such a twit. I was like, why don't I use the stove with kids? I use it as this teacher thing. I mean, a kindergartner wouldn't get it. A second grader probably wouldn't get it, but third or fourth and up. So he said, I've got a picture of the stove in my classroom and kids will look at me and say, I know we're practicing this to get it to the back burners, you know, typical jaded middle school remark, you know? And, and so that was so powerful for me that, that, you know, you could actually, you know, 
whip out a picture of the stove and kind of talk through how that's working. And that's not where these things are actually happening in the brain, by the way. This is not a brain diagram. This is just a, a metaphor. But, right. uh, you know, I don't want Marianne Wolf saying, well, what is William saying about the frontal lobe? Like, that's not what I'm saying at all. Um, but, but, you know, the idea of not being able to juggle, um, and we all get to that point. Uh, you know, when I do an all day workshop at three o'clock, everybody is no longer available to take anything in in their working memory. You know, we get to a point where I've had enough. I can't do anything more. Um, right. and, and we all do that. If, if somebody's giving you directions or something, there comes a certain point where you say, wait, let me get a piece of paper or let me take out my phone and write this down because you're not going to be able to hold on to that and, you know, process it in the way that you need to later. Yeah, definitely. So um, what are your feelings? I mean, so you were talking about handwriting instruction, but what about cursive instruction? Because that's a, that's a question that comes up a lot. When I haven't watched this other person you interviewed, and I don't know whether I'm going to be disagreeing with them or causing a fist no. fight or what I'm going to be doing. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> so it's like, you know. Mm. I heard her lecture. I haven't interviewed her. <laughs> okay, fair. So, um, uh, well, let me tell you all my bias, I guess. Um, I was trained by a woman who passed away two years ago at the age of 90. Her name is Diana Hanbury King. And um, uh, she is one of the big gurus in the Orton Gillingham world and the dyslexia world. But she had a couple of different sort of known specialties. And in the Orton Gillingham world, she was one of the go to's for handwriting. And so, you know, people who were trained by her, we came out with kind of a handwriting specialty. Um, and we've got other things we're not, you know, I know people who were trained by one of the big phonology gurus. I can do phonology fine, but I'm not like, you know, at the level that I can handwriting. So, so I, I look at my work uh, with Diana and I got really lucky my third or fourth summer. I'm working at the summer camp uh, where, that she founded, uh, Donna Beck. Um, they gave me these two kids who were older kids who both were in hindsight, I think one of them was diagnosed as graphic, but I think they were both genuinely just graphic. And Diana basically observed me tutoring. She tutored, me, tutored them in front of me. I went and watched her tutor other kids in handwriting. And I kind of took it as my passion that summer. And that's not something I normally like. I'm into advanced language and writing and what have you. Handwriting is sort of my foundational skill specialty. My other, you know, I mean, I can do syllabication and whatever, but, but like, you know, that's kind of my go-to. And First of all, Graham has told us there is not a single research study that has measured cursive over print or print over cursive in terms of which is better for mainstream kids. Not one. Um, I can tell you that the nuns all are in favor of cursive, that the entire continent of Europe starts with cursive in first grade, um, that the Montessori folks are cursive, that occupational therapists past the age of five years old or six years old, they are all pro-cursive. There are a lot of people who are very, very pro uh, you know, cursive over manuscript. A lot of the schools for students with dyslexia start cursive in first grade. And I have never seen any of those kids um, uh, you know, that it's a detriment to any of those kids, that it's delaying the reading or remediation. And these are strugglers, right? They're not your mainstream kids. Okay. So all of that said, um, what I would tell you is this, your typical mainstream school is going to do manuscript for the first couple of years, cursive for the next couple of years. Um, uh, Ginger Berninger is very clear that you need two complete years of a stroke. She and Bev Wolf did this work um, for it to automatize. So if you're going to do two years of manuscript, and then do cursive, that's fine. But you can't do cursive for three months and then wonder why the kids revert, right? And they'll, you know, people will say, oh, the cursive is, you know, the cursive is much prettier, but they went back to manuscript. Yeah, because in fourth grade, they're copying notes from the board. And the only thing they want is to not be the last one copying. So they're going to go back to their illegible, horribly formed, capitals in the middle, disjointed manuscript because it's faster. And that, the only reason it's faster is because they didn't spend enough time on the cursive. So, so, you know, I would be inclined for a number of reasons to support cursive earlier, but if not, at the very least, when you do get to cursive, you're going to maintain that instruction for at least two years. With a remedial kid or a struggling kid, I would recommend cursive, you know, from the get-go, uh, once you figure out that the manuscript isn't taken. And I would say, okay, well, let's start this in second grade or let's start this in late first grade. I've never seen a kid damaged by that process at all. And most kids <coughs> who struggle with manuscript, cursive is going to be easier and better. Not all. I mean, we'll have some exceptions, but most. So the, the only thing I don't want is I don't want teachers to think that manuscript has to be mastered before they can go into cursive. That's not true. So the, the skills involved in manuscript are very different from cursive. And a lot of the advantages of cursive, what makes it easier 
Um, those things aren't, you know, things like the letters connect so you don't have to stop and start 50 times, you know, or whatever. Those things, manuscript doesn't ever do, they're always going to be separated letters. So a lot of the reasons to move to cursive um, are actually uh, benefits that are unique to cursive. Um, and I've seen students with the most horrific print in the world, and within a month or two, their cursive is better looking than anything they've done in manuscript for two or three years in a row. Um, so, so, you know, I haven't seen a study, but I can tell you that my empirical experience um, through a long time, and, you know, Diana taught kids for 70 years um, in handwriting, would tell you that um, mainstream kids, it may not matter which but struggling kids, cursive is vastly better um, for most of those kids. So why not do cursive instruction for everybody, at least starting in, you know, mid second grade, whenever that's typically done in a lot of states and situations. Well, no, that's a great answer. Um, well, I mean, you're the expert. So of course it's a great I'm answer. not the expert. There are people who know a lot more than <laughs> I do, but I, I mean, I do, I am grounded in a bunch of personal experience working with kids with this and, and, and watching schools transform. I have a, there's a little school. Um, I've got two schools on a little grant up in Montana that I'm on a, a striving readers grant. And one of them, other consultants up there, they're not hitting handwriting like I am. They're leaving them alone. They're doing phonology and, and, you know, their core curriculum and, and they're doing great, great things. But my school's, I'm always talking about handwriting. I'm sure they're sick to death of me, but one of the little fourth grade, one of the fourth grade teachers, I didn't mean the little fourth grade teacher, little kids, okay. She said, William, I've been doing this handwriting thing and the, 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 we've been up there for three years. So these fourth graders, they've been there for several years. She said, I can't tell you, even in COVID, blended model, hot mess in teaching right now, all across the country. She said, I can't tell you how great their handwriting is. I wish you could see it firsthand because I'm not going up there right now. I've been doing all my consulting is virtual right now. So uh, she really basically, she owned that it was worth my annoying her for the last couple of years, you know, that it really paid off. You can get, you know, people who say, oh, it's too late after they're, you know, three days old. It's not. Um, if you want to commit to it um, and you're willing to put the time in, um, I can walk into a middle school classroom and walk up to a kid with a really, really off grip and lean down and say, hey, does it hurt when you write? The answer is always yes always not if it's a little off i'm talking about one of those grips where you're like this ought to be you know in the journal of odd grips you know like right there those kids they're always you know laborious painful what have you and the problem is kindergarten first second grade teachers they don't know it's going to happen because they don't write that much in those grades. i mean they do write some but not to the length that they would where they they need the you know sort of anti-fatigue medicine if you will um of a right. good grade. right so one thing i want to ask you about is and we were talking about this a little bit beforehand, before we went live, was specifically about like keyboarding. So especially with the dysgraphic kid, sort of like moving into keyboarding. Mm -hmm. One of the arguments that I made against uh, somebody that brought it up to me was I was like, why are you going to hand a child a keyboard and say, here, write with a keyboard if you didn't teach them syntax and grammar and all of that? You're just handing them a different way to not generate writing effectively. To fail. Okay, fair, <laughs> fair. I got gotcha. you. Um, but how do you see occupational therapy and assistive technology complementing this uh, area? Okay, so so I think one of the most interesting conversations you can have in a parent group, in a teacher group, on one of the many Facebook groups, one of the most interesting comedy, uh, conversations you can have is the is the the tough line between remediation and accommodation, right? This sort of juxta, you know, and, and parents grapple with this, teachers grapple with this, parents get frustrated with teachers who they feel like are accommodating and not remediating or remediating when they should be accommodating. And I get it. And they're trying to do what's right for their kids and what have you. So, so, and I think, you know, some of that is really tricky. You know, uh, one of the things I was saying to you before we started this is some students with dysgraphia, with actual dysgraphia, not misdiagnosed, they take to the keyboard really well. And they become really good uh, keyboard, you know, word processors, uh, typists, if you want. And that's the solution. But some kids, I've worked with some graphics graphi where you put them on the keyboard, it's just as bad. Even with good instruction, they are always hunt and peck. Now, the advantage, of course, is when they do get their finger over to the key, the, the <laughs> you know, the computer does the rest for them, right? The letter is well formed. It's legible. It's what have you. And with spell check and grammar check, you get to some certain tools uh, that are useful. And spell check and grammar check are vastly better than they were in the early 90s when they first came out. 
So, you know, but you've also got to have with grammar check, you've got to have enough grammar in you to understand why the green line just happened. Um, right. Spell check now, I like, people don't remember how bad it was in the 90s. You know, they, this word is misspelled. Here are your seven choices. Please feel free to read over all of these and see if you can figure out which one is right. And right. so kids are picking the first one all, it would turns it into Mad Libs. It's kind of fun, but you don't end up with a product you want. Okay, so, so you know, when I'm looking at that keyboarding piece, I don't really see keyboarding as an accommodation as much as a one of the paths that we're going to follow is keyboarding. And with a kid who is really struggling with handwriting, we're probably gonna take that path sooner but we're not leaving handwriting behind. We're still on that path as well. Um, so, you know, and, and I, I do think in the tech generation, we're doing, you know, we're going to do a laptop in everybody's hand or we're doing Chromebooks or we're doing, you know, iPads or whatever we're doing. Um, and everybody's going to have this much time and, and all this stuff. But, but you know, we're going to teach them PowerPoint. We're going to teach them Excel so they can survive in the business world. They're going to do all these things and they're going to learn, you know, design programs. And that's all great. But if you don't have keyboarding skills, and, and, you know, that takes somebody who's actually trained in teaching keyboarding skills, not somebody who can do a great wiki, you know, whatever, uh, you know, and so, so you got to have somebody with those foundational skills and those keyboarding skills facilitate when you're putting the captions in your PowerPoint, when you're writing an essay that you're, you know, going to dump into the Google drive. Um, otherwise, you're in the exact same working memory issue. Instead of my generating good text about my topic, about Martin Luther King, about whatever it might be, I'm trying to find where the H is on my keyboard. Well, that means I'm not writing as well about my topic because I'm spending some of my working memory locating the key. Um, so, you know, I'm going to want to teach good handwriting or excuse me, good keyboarding in the same way that I want to teach good handwriting. Um, and then if, if I've got a genuine dysgraphic who also the, the keyboarding is not coming very automatically, that's certainly a place where I may be going to speech to text or, you know, one of the assistive tech pieces. Um, and I'm not opposed to any of that. That's a savior for some people. Um, but I also don't want to make that jump too quickly. Or if I am making that jump, I want to be working with some of the other things as well. It doesn't have to be an either or. It can be a both and. Um, you know, you can be doing keyboarding while you're all, and some kids take to speech to text. They're like, I am now going to dictate war and peace and I'm super ready to go. Some kids, you teach them uh, speech to text it's super torturous for them. They're very uncomfortable with it. Even if their articulation is good enough to make use of it, they're like, this is never going to work for me. I'm not doing this, blah, blah, blah. And you either have to revisit it or it's not a good path for them. And we've got to tease apart which paths work for which kids, but not feel like if we choose one path, we have to give up on the others. What about occupational therapy as it comes to helping with handwriting and those various components? So I, I, in the, in the whatever of full disclosure, I am not an OT. Um, so, and my OT is no more than that, uh, uh, more than I do about this. But I will tell you this, I love it when OTs are in my handwriting workshops um, because usually we're in total sync, but it's really, we have really rich conversations. Um, I support OTs work. And I think getting an OTs input on a kid for whom handwriting is a struggle is really, really important. Sometimes some OTs seem to say it's too late to do this or it's too late to fix this or, you know, the kid's gotten too old or blah, blah, blah. We can't fix the grip and whatever. That's not my personal experience. Um, and, uh, you know, I was in a wonderful conversation with Louisa Moat, so I know you, uh, you interviewed about uh, Diana King via email. I don't know. It's probably been a year ago now. I feel like time has kind of weirdly uh, so it, but, but, you know, I, I emailed her and was talking to her about handwriting and Diana. And um, I don't remember exactly the exact wording. I haven't seen the email in a while, but, but you know, Louisa basically said, William, Diana could take somebody who was sort of classified as dysgraphic, who everybody said was never going to write. And by golly, she would get those kid, that kid writing again, you know, whatever. Um, I'm, uh, I'm definitely uh, somebody who believes that it's worth the fight to try and see and that, you know, we shouldn't give up too quickly. But there are also situations where that path isn't working. Um, and we are going to want to find some alternatives. What uh, Ginger Berninger says, though, is even with a student with dysgraphia, we're not giving up on handwriting instruction. Um, even if they're never going to be a fluid handwriter, you're going to need that instruction for the components it gives to better spelling and better reading. We're going to have to have those pieces embedded into what we're doing. Um, so I'm a, like I said earlier, I'm a both and, not an either or person. Where, where we run into trick, uh, you know, sort of the, the touch is where's the line? 
how much accommodation versus remediation, um, you know, and, and OTs, they have a whole suite of skills and background that we don't have. They also have oftentimes one-on-one -on -one with the kid that they can really work on and address things. Um, and, and, you know, that dysgraphia piece, it's not just handwriting. It's not just spelling. It can be written output. It can be some, you know, amalgamation of, of a variety of different skills. They can also help us tease apart what exactly is going on with that kid and what might be uh, needed to be addressed, I guess. That's awesome. Um, so I've asked you a lot of questions, but I wanted to sort of be able to open it up to you as well based off of, am I not asking you something that you feel is important that needs to be shared? Is that a fair question? <laughs> yeah, that's a fair question, I guess. Um, uh, no, I mean, I, I, I guess sounds snarky. That's not what I'm trying to say at all. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I think you've managed to hit all the things I love to talk about. Um, I think, uh, I mean, you know, well, here, I can add a couple things. Uh, I also think that in order to write and to read, uh, you need a vocabulary that has some breadth. And I don't think I've said the word vocabulary once, or if I have, it was sort of in passing. Um, you know, one of the things that makes it more interesting to say, uh, you know, a, a certain uh, sentence to, uh, more interesting, a certain paragraph more interesting is a certain level of uh, vivid vocabulary or also more precise vocabulary. You know, I was talking to a group of teachers the other day about the difference between, um, so if you say I'm scared, there's a difference between terrified and anxious. And you start to get into sort of terms that make the, you know, what Beck talks about, Isabel Beck talks about using more precise uh, vocabulary or precise ways of using vocabulary. Um, are there things that make you anxious versus things that make you terrified? You know, um, uh, you know, running late for a doctor's appointment makes you anxious, but probably not terrified. 400 spiders in your kitchen probably makes you terrified. You're past the anxious point, you know? So like, you know, what, what engenders a certain response from people and also the power to kind of use a word. Scared covers both of them, but yeah. not in as good a way. So, you know, I think about that for essay writing too. Uh, you know, the, the difference between something like interpret and analyze you know, or, or explain um, and elaborate upon, you know, those kinds of, of, you know, sort of tier two academic vocabulary words. You've got to be comfortable enough with those too, because you can have really good syntax and really good sort of paragraph structure and essay structure and what have you, and you can lack the breadth of vocabulary. And I'm sure that happens sometimes with your son as well. You know, you've got your handwriting, your spelling, your what have you, and the vocabulary that he might use in his home, just walking down the hall with you, doesn't come out in the paragraph because he's like, look, I was trying to spell it and form the letters. Give me a break, you know. Um, uh, you know, Diana used to do these really great writing samples where she would tell a kid that spelling math matters for one writing sample. And then she would tell a kid, spelling doesn't matter. We're not counting off for it all with another writing sample, same kid. And you'd look at the difference. So in the first one, he's using fun and big and hot because he can spell them. I've never seen a kid misspell the word fun ever, okay? Um, in the other one, he's using things like, you know, hilarious and awesome and exciting and, you know, whatever. He's bringing his A game. They are all misspelled, but who cares, you know, because the spelling doesn't matter. And they're able to, what I call, write their brain instead of write their spelling level. Um, and that's empowering, but somebody like, you know, what you're saying about your kid, whether I tell him spelling counts or not, he's still got to use some working memory to sound it out so it's at least recognizable. Well, I'm a good speller. That's not working memory I have to use. So he's going to be at a disadvantage if he's, you know, writing with a group of peers, some of whom can spell well. Um. And, you know, from my perspective as a parent advocate, that's a frustrating thing for me when the kids have to switch papers, mm. you know, and sort of grade each other's writing. And <laughs> so that's a stressor for me because it's something that stresses him and it's not something that he wants. Well, and so that annoys me to no end because uh, uh, not your kid's reaction, but that process. Peer editing, there's really good research on that. And it's so awesome. I do a lot of this in my workshops with teachers. But the deal with peer editing is peer editing isn't meant to be peer proofreading. It's not meant to be peer proofreading. It's meant to be peer editing and revising. So it's things like, do you have a good hook? Do you have enough evidence? Are you backing up? Those are things your kid can do. He right. can say, your hook grabbed me. He can't say you spelled anti-disestablishmentarianism correctly, and nor should he, okay? Like, that's not his goal. So, you know, when I look at peer editing, and, and teachers typically, 
um, kids do peer proofreading because it's what they remember from teacher editing. They make marks and whatever, and that's going to happen. I, you know, I'm not telling teachers they shouldn't mark up papers, but you know, the big idea is like this is unclear or whatever. Those are the things that really should be a part of peer editing. And it turns out teachers are often scared to do that. That's what the research says. So we need to train teachers to do peer editing. We also need to train teachers to model what peer editing looks like for kids. Like you know, I'm not. So when I do peer editing with kids, what I do is group editing. We stick an essay and it's not somebody in the room. It's a paper from another class or whatever. We stick it up on the board and they analyze, they take it apart, they might use a rubric. Research says you get more out of analyzing somebody else's paper than you do out of getting feedback on your own paper. That's super interesting. So, you know, we need to do a lot of that. When I was tutoring one-on-one, -on -one, I'm not doing much of that now, but when I was tutoring one-on-one, -on -one, a lot, I never once looked at somebody else's paper and got the kid to help me edit it, never. Well, that's a mistake. Um, and, and, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, you tend not to have like a whole class of papers, but, but like, you know, getting a kid to kind of look at a paper through the lens of our goals really, really powerful. Then when they go to write the next time, they go, okay, you know, Miss Roberts, I'm making you my teacher, Miss Roberts, she, we spent like 20 minutes talking about the hook and how important it is. I better write an interesting hook because she's going to be all over me. And we're kind of learning not just that I need to do that, but what it would involve to do that, you know, what makes a good hook. And because we've practiced revising or working with or noticing a good hook in somebody else's writing. That's a great explanation. I keep saying it's a great explanation, but it's a great explanation. Well, I'm not giving you short clips. I, I'm capable of short clips sometimes, but you're asking me stuff that I like. I have a lot to say about, so sorry. <laughs> no, please don't apologize. This is why I ask you to be on. Um, I want, I kind of wanted to get to, to one thing and I, I, I was a couple of minutes late when you, when you started this section because I got caught out in the hallway a year and a half ago when you were lecturing by somebody that was asking me a question. But one of the things are you going to ask me what I was talking about a year and a half ago? Because I don't remember. I vaguely no, 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 no. remember that we were there, like, and I remember the room we were in. Okay, good. I just wanted to be really clear about my <laughs> my abilities because that's not one of them. Okay. No, no. But like one of the things that you were focused on, and I just I just don't remember what you called it. Was you know I think what you put up was a math word problem, and it was you know this really long word problem. And one of the skills that you or the skill that you were specifically focusing on was being able to take out all of the superfluous language to get to what was actually there. Ah, okay. <laughs> no, that's that's something I would have done. Yes. So <laughs> that's all I'm saying, but that's something I would have done. That's true. Um, but but I wanted to specifically talk about that because that's another thing that came up in my house just yesterday. Because my son goes, Mom, Katie's been in a car for five hours and she's traveled 65 miles. I, I, I can't even figure out the equation. How many miles per hour is she, is she traveling? I'm like, I just repeated it back to him. And he went, oh, I got it. <laughs> it was somehow, however it was presented to him, didn't make any sense to him. But, you know. Did you repeat it back to him the way it was written? Or did you reword it? I reworded it. Ah, so then what you want to do, what the skill you would work on there is to teach the kid to reword it. So that's your next step if you want to, because uh, unless your kid wants you to go to college with him, and I'm guessing by that point, he will not. I'm just going to tell you, like, I don't, you know, I don't know for sure, but probably not. So, you know, um, if you're, you know, I, I've got a couple of math teachers in one of those schools in Montana, and they're doing some paraphrasing of word problems. You know, word problems are a set thing. No math teacher's trying to be mean, but a lot of our kids with language struggles, they struggle when it gets to the word problems. Well, you know, and people say, well, I don't know why math needs to be word problems. We'll just use numbers. Uh, -uh. Word problems is where the real life math comes in. You know, it's like, how do I take this weird thing I've got to do and figure out an equation to solve it? That's the real stuff. Right. So, so the fact that it's syntactically weird, you know, some of it is the vocabulary like of often stands for times, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, some of it is like numeracy skills like Marilyn Zecker, who's, you know, one of the big math gurus in our field. Um, you know, some of the stuff like that, but some of it is an understanding of how the words are organized syntactically to convey meaning and sort of untangling that. And so, you know, I don't, uh, I don't remember, you know, what you're talking about from my workshop, but I, it's very likely that I did something like that. And, you know, one of the things I find is if you can find those doers and do's, the subjects and predicates, that's a key part of what's going on. But you also need to sort of like, you may need to take notes as you're reading it. So you say, okay, you know, Mary had 35 baskets. Let's get 35 down okay somebody stole seven okay stole is that a minus or a plus you know is that addition or subtraction whatever um okay stole we've lost seven okay 
Uh oh. Are you there? Is it me or is it you? <laughs> oh, we've frozen for a second. I hope everybody's enjoying this. It's really good. William is an awesome guest. William. I hope I haven't lost you completely. Oh, goodness. Uh, there Hi. You, <laughs> you froze or I froze or somebody froze. It may have been me. I, I'm hoping it was you and not me. I'm not sure. <laughs> it may have been me. It's totally possible. Um, uh, so uh, life happens here and you know everybody's using the internet a little bit more than they usually do. Um, so, so you know, all I was saying was as you do a math problem, you know, thinking about sort of step by step, um, here's what happens in that first sentence, what's that in math? And then, you know, following it through uh, step by step. If you're having to paraphrase for your kid, you know, the next thing to do would be, hey, let's put this in simpler terms. Can you help me do this, right? And working with the kid to paraphrase it himself. So I guess, so what I took out of that is helping them using their grammar and syntax tools, strip out the do and the doer in order Certainly to find first, the core yeah, language. If you can't find the subject predicate of a sentence, whether you know what those words mean or not, you don't know what the sentence is about. You've yeah. got to know what those are about. But they use things like, uh, you know, uh, stole or, or um, uh, lost or whatever, you know, stole and lost, those are both verbs for subtraction. Right. So right. we got to think about that. And what does that mean? And, you know, targeting a verb and saying, if I say lost, what's happening? Am I getting more of them? No. Well, let's verbalize that then. What would we use to represent lost? That kind of thing. I mean, math is not my superpower by any means. Um, I taught a little algebra, had a super good time with it. Um, but they've also got to know vocabulary. You know, if you say, so what's the product of these two numbers? If you don't know what product is, you're done. Right. That's it. And one of the answers on that multiple choice test, it will be the sum. They're checking in on whether you know the word product. Um, and the sum will mislead you if you think, if you don't know what product is. And, you know, that's on us. We've got to really become facile with the vocabulary of math, just like I was talking about the vocabulary of syntax to facilitate communication, but also so we understand what's being said. Definitely. So I don't have any more questions for you unless you have any final thoughts. No, this has been great. I've had a super good time. I hope your, your group or your audience or what have you has enjoyed it. Um, I like talking about syntax and handwriting. I can talk about all the things I love. So uh, that's been awesome. And you've been delightful. Um, I, I hope you're, uh, do not go to your son after this and say, well, this guy said we've got to work for seven hours a day. So it's all his fault. Okay. I don't want to be blamed for anything you're doing with your kid. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so I had a great time. This has been super fun. Um, and thank you for, for inviting me to join you. Thank you so much for having us. It's truly been a pleasure from my side as well. Good, good, good. Thank Thanks. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Yep, you too. All right, take care. Bye. Bye.